It is our great good fortune to be joined by these two gentlemen to my right, for whom I will give a brief introduction so that we can jump right into the conversation. Um, to my immediate right, David Goldman is the founder and chairman of the fellowships at Auschwitz for the Study of Professional Ethics, or FASB, more information about which is in your program. David is a graduate of Washington University, Yale Law School. He has served on the board of a number of for-profit and non-profit organizations and was the chairman of the Auschwitz Jewish Center and serves on the board of the American Friends of the Poland Museum. Welcome, David. And uh, to his right, oh, I'm sorry. I know better than to step on your applause, I'm sorry. To his right is Father Stephen Bell, who was the associate pastor of Newman Hall Holy Spirit Parish at the University of California at Berkeley. He is a member of the FASB faculty, and he also leads parish missions, retreats, revivals, and workshops, all of which consider the importance of reconciliation and healing. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. And I am going to, oh, I did it again. David, I would love for you to take it away. Okay. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, what I'd like, uh, first of all, thanks all for staying. Um, we appreciate it. That was some performance, Gabe. You should be proud to be part of it. It was wonderful. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, I have a, a question that I want to ask Father Bell, but before I ask that question, I want to describe the premise of, of FASB and what we do, because I think it's relevant to the question that I have for Father Bell. The fact is that the professionals, the professional class, the lawyers, the doctors, the business people, the clergy, the press, it was they who made it happen. Yes, the, 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 the leaders, the political leaders were problematic, but without the, without the design, without the work done by the professionals, it would not have happened. Most of what occurred was done under law. The lawyers wrote the laws. As you saw over the past hour and a half, the doctors were enormously complicit. The press became the propagandists, the clergy became the apologists, the business people employed the slave labor. So the, the question that we ask is why they did it. Why did these professionals behave as they did? What we know is that to a very large extent, it was not because there was a gun to their head. We also know it was not largely out of ideology. So why did they behave the way they did? What motivated them and what can we learn about ourselves by looking at, at these people? I, I wanna give a, a quick example and then I'll turn to Father Bell. The crematoria at Auschwitz that were mentioned today were designed by a company called Topf and Sons, a local German a privately held company, uh, they sought the work. They competed for that job. After the war, we learned why they wanted that job, and the answer was that the engineers who worked for the company saw that task, building the crematoria, solving the problem that they had, which was how to dispose of so many bodies. Those engineers wanted the work because they saw it as an engineering challenge. They wanted the work because it was a challenge. After the war, they, they were asked, they, they talked about it, and the answer that they gave was that their job was to solve a problem. And so they said, why should you come to us? Why, why complain to us because all we were were problem solvers? If you, have, if you want to complain to somebody else, go complain, but don't come to us, the professionals, the engineers. And so the question that we look at is whether we can think of our jobs as being morally neutral today. Can we as engineers, lawyers, doctors, and so forth, think of our jobs as morally neutral? So again, the question is, who were they and why did they behave the way they did? The fact is, I don't know of anyone who thinks more about that question and thinks better about that question than Father Bell. So I have a, a really simple question. Uh, we heard a lot today, tonight, about the Commandant of Auschwitz. We saw photos of him. We saw photos of his children. We saw photos of his home. We saw photos of his children at play. 
So the question I have for you is whether he could have been a good father. Could the commandant of Auschwitz have been a good father? There's a book uh, I have which is called The Private Lives of, of the Auschwitz SS. There's a, um, a quote in here that I'd like to read about him. And it, was, it comes from a woman who worked at the uh, Haas household. At home, she said, Haas was ideal. He loved the children. He liked to lie down with them on the sofa in their room. He kissed them, caressed them, and talked to them in a lovely way. Past the threshold of the house, he changed totally. He never said a word to me. Father Bell, could he have been a good father? Yeah, as I, as I think about the question, it's very provocative because there are several factors that really go into trying to understand what it is that we're kind of dealing with here. Uh, could he be a good father? I guess the answer to any could question is yes. But what are the factors that really uh, go into, if you will, where we stand on the answer to that question? And there are three things that I want to maybe um, bring to the floor to hopefully spur some thought about. First is perspective. From whose eyes are we getting the, the narrative? Uh, from this is, is the children's perspective. And of course, that intimacy, of course, has to hold some sort of credibility. And so if the children says, you know, he came home at night, he tucked us in, he read us stories, he provided for us, he was, in our opinion, a good father. That has to have some weight. But then from the perspective of, say, a social narrative, is it the ones who got hurt the most by whatever he did? Uh, do, does their story uh, deserve greater weight, if you will, even though the relationship was not as close? And that really takes into consideration the fact that the image of the father, the, the importance of the father, even the legacy of the father also has to consider their participation in society. So if they were, in fact, uh, you know, party uh, to a first degree, to such a, a, a mass destruction of, of people, then, then that's definitely going to gravely color how we begin to think about his ability to be a good father. So that's the first thing, is about perspective. From whose eyes are we, are we seeing this, this uh, individual? The, the second thing has to do, I would say, around um, our, our, our judgment of legacy. Um, and I, you know, I want to I want to be very careful as I as I talk about this because the things that we are judging these days don't hold the same gravity as the Holocaust did. But we might want to look at this from a from a phenomenon perspective. When we looked at, uh, at you know during during COVID the toppling of many statues of people that were erected at a time when we hailed them as heroes. We saw them as worthy figures, as examples and mirrors to follow. And then our research and our, and our understanding of their participation in, in, uh, in our society's life was not so great. And in fact, in many cases, were, was pretty horrifying. And so now, as we begin to judge their legacy, the basis upon our judgment, the criteria, the actions, hold different weight. And so we have to consider that as well. I'm not gonna go so far as to say it's capricious because it could be very developmental. The things that we knew in the past, uh, or, or the things that we know now, rather, are different than the things that we knew in the past. They, they've, they've, uh, we, we've, had an opportunity to, to let them gel, to let them marinate, to see just how much they do reflect the kinds of values that we hold in a person that we would revere, say, for instance, a father. And then the third thing, is, as I, I, I think might be the most controversial, and that is um, how many narratives uh, do we make room for? Whose narratives do we make room for? And what kind of, uh, of, of weight are, are we actually giving those kinds of narratives? 
And so when we, when we think about the fact that there has to be story that helps us to really categorize, uh, or, or not categorize, but bring into a greater dimension this person that we're referring to, we have to look at this from a wide, from a wide angle. And then it gets very complicated. So it's not just the children saying he was a good man and just the victim saying that he was a bad man. We heard several examples of, uh, of, of inmates, prisoners in Auschwitz coming up to Mengele, or coming, sorry, coming up to... Um, Verts. Verts, thank you. To Verts and saying, uh, w was basically telling him that he was, in, in a sense, a, a good provider. He was a healer. He was uh, the one that was saving them from a, from a worse fate. And so is there room for that story in this, in this characterization? and this understanding of this person. Um, is there room for the, for the story of the family member who, for whom this person got on their last good nerve and couldn't do anything right, you know? Uh, so really kind of looking at that, how much space have we actually made for the various narratives to come in? And so that really, it, 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 pre it presents to us a pretty horrible challenge and reality that I do think at this point in our, in our history, we're really just starting to come to terms with. Well, I admit as the father of three children, I'm sort of curious about the answer to this question, not that I wanna compare myself, <laughs> to, but, but I wanna talk about your second category. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that when we think of whether it's the commandant of Auschwitz or others throughout history, that we should be thinking about them and their behavior in terms of the times, in terms of, of, of what was accepted or not accepted at the time? I don't know if we can stop there because we have to consider that the, you know, that the action at the time was thought of in that particular way, but with greater awareness with a greater, and I'm sorry, I got to throw a religious word in there, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be worthy of wearing this. Uh, greater discernment, really kind of, uh, of looking at the re reality uh, and the impact of that reality on us today. I think it just takes time. It really takes time. And so I don't think that we do a service by saying, well, that's what we did back then, because I don't think that that's the whole truth. In fact, I think that's only part of the truth. The other thing is it keeps the, it keeps the, um, the awareness of the action in more of a you know, black or white uh, perspective as opposed to really looking at some of the nuances that were also in play there. I want to move on to a, a, a somewhat separate question, but before I do, and, and you and I have had this conversation only 130 times maybe, and, and I should add that, that this conversation came up because of a question that Moises Kaufman, the, the playwright and director, uh, asked me uh, four or five years ago when we were first talking about the play, and he asked me whether I thought he could be, a, uh, Huss could be a good father. I, I look at this, again, as a father perhaps, as a flawed father, um, and I, I see the answer as being quite simple, which is, if my children can say, my father, though flawed, was a good man, I'm comfortable with that. And when I look at the grandson of Haas, it seems to me that he's making that same simple point as well. No matter what else, I can't think of him as a good man. How do we? How do you feel about that? I, I think there is a multiplicity of ways of dealing with the sins of the fathers, and we saw that exemplified several in several different ways in the play. So, is it that we are uncovering the story to to um, know about it, but then to, in some ways, kind of hide it again? Are we using the pro the process? I, I'd say as um, as Huss did, which is called uh, transgressive reinscription, kind of taking, keeping the last name was very um, 
prophetic, if you will, and, and an act of, of resistance that we probably wouldn't necessarily consider, except that he's trying to redefine what that name stands for, uh, and him taking it on and crediting it, crediting it as his best revenge is, is, a, is a great demonstration of that. But, you know, we also were hearing many stories from a past generation that would hide these stories. We just don't talk about it. This is not, uh, you know, the ugly histories, um, are, are, we're, we're paralyzed by them. We, we don't have the kind of language that we need to be able to match such horrible actions, first order, secondary participation, however far, if there was a connection to it, we don't have the language to be able to talk about that and at the same time maintain some sort of either cultural, sociological, family, or personal respect. And, and love for the person, uh, which is, you know, I think this is one of the great gifts of art because I think that the only way that we currently have to talk about this right now, right now, is, uh, is through artistic expression, music, poetry, the theater. Um, I do, however, have great hope. So let me, let me also say that. And let's just, uh, I just want to kind of put this alongside one thing. If you think about when African Americans were integrated into society uh, after the Civil War, it started with a language of tolerance. And so we, we started to say, you know, we have, to aware, we have to become aware that the space needs to be bigger now. The space of acceptance has to be bigger now. And we use that language of tolerance to be able to actually begin to make that space. Well, that was back then, uh, and I would say that tolerance kind of ended its, uh, its, its greatness probably around the 70s. And then it became about inclusivity, and now it's about acceptance. And so really kind of looking at how that development uh, uh, goes on, as long as we continue to talk about it and engage it, and see this as more of a human issue as opposed to something that those people did, I think we'll also get to the point where we can have the language to, to talk about this. I think to Father Bell's point about the, the role of art, uh, I, I think it gets to a maybe a, a more important part, which is the importance of history and the perspectives that history provides. So we can look at this period and we can look at these people and wonder about ourselves, because we can see ourselves through them, not to humanize them, not to excuse what they did, but to, to learn about ourselves. So I want to talk about a, a comment that was made in the play about compartmentalizing, uh, which is, a, a, I think, a, a critical component of how to think about these people. Is it possible to compartmentalize? Can, and, and what, Yes, it's possible, but what are the implications of it? H how do we think about, is it about compartmentalization? Can we look at it as a justification, as a rationalization, as an excuse? H how should we think about it? And not just for these people, but for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, George Stanton, who's a professor at George Mason University, actually runs a genocidal theory, if you will, department. And he came up with a, a 10 step pro, uh, uh, progress, if you will, that goes from, uh, starts at the, at the very early stages of dehumanizing through, through categorization, through symbolization, and through compartmentalization to really take away that us-ness, if you will, and to enforce a them versus us. Oh, sorry, I take away the we-ness, uh, and turn it into a them versus us. And that's where compartmentalization is very helpful because then we begin to disassociate our experience from the experience of the other. Now what was really uh, wonderfully uh, said by the, by the uh, museum curator who had the album is that when we think about Auschwitz and particularly think about it from uh, the perspective of how the uh, memorials are presenting uh, the, the Holocaust, it's about having us to give back the humanity to those that the Third Reich was, uh, to those whose humanity was taken away by the Third Reich. And so we begin to give uh, humanity back to the victims by giving them the regard, 
by restoring their, their dignity, awareness, and by fostering some empathy there. But we might actually run the same kind of strategies that the Reich used to dehumanize the Jews for the perpetrators. And this is when we start saying, look at those monsters. <laughs> and I think this is where we're really getting into some difficulty uh, of, of seeing photos like this, is it rehumanizes them. And so no longer can we look at them through the glass, rather the glass turns into a mirror. And then we begin to see the complexities of human experience um, in, in their lives and hopefully draw the parallels to ours and it restores some introspection. Now this doesn't mean that we go and we wag our finger in the mirror, but we do have to consider that because a gun was not put to their head, there were other things that may have compelled them. Family obligation, loyalties and, 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 uh, and, thing, and obedience structures that they were under. Um, a, a sense of helplessness, if you will, and all those sorts of things. Now, this may also seem like a justification, but what I'm suggesting is that there are many factors that are in there. And if we are going to persecute them, rightfully so, we also have to take a look at ourselves and how and what is the, what we're participating in. So, sorry, may, may I just elaborate? Uh, ask because one of the I love everything you just said, and there's the part in the play where they talk about how responsibility was dispersed amongst many, um, and I, I've, uh, I, had, I hadn't considered that part of it before, that it was broken down just enough that the specific role one might play was discreet enough that um, it allowed perhaps in some sort of compartmentalization yeah. to um, ab absolve oneself of any real sense of responsibility. It also becomes a defense mechanism. I mean, it allows a person to actually do that kind of work. I, I wouldn't underestimate the point that Father Bell makes, though, about motivations as mundane as taking care of the family, mm -hmm. as gaining status in the community, as even financial items. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 what motivated them, yes, they could compartmentalize perhaps, yes, they, the, the responsibilities may have been dispersed enough, but they were dealing with the mundane on a day-to-day -day basis. Indeed, indeed, and, and of course, as we have all experienced, those mundane factors have their days. They have their days at, at times when, you know, when we're worried about something that we find ourselves responsible for, also, you know, what happens when you kind of get stuck in a routine? You know, this is just what I do. This is, this is what seems to be my normal without any kind of reflection on what the implications of that normal is actually doing. Maybe we should open this up to questions. Before we do, if I could, um, the, the reason I've been playing with my phone for the past 20 minutes is I've been looking for a, a, um, a, a quote. Um, Probably the most important scholar in studying the doctors uh, was a psychologist from Yale named Robert J. Lifton. And he describes a conversation that he had with the daughter of uh, Wirtz, who was a very complicated man. What, what um, they allude to in the play is that he had a lengthy correspondence with his father in which he writes to his father and says, I don't really like what I'm doing here. I don't want to be here. I want to ask for a transfer. And his father, as they say in the play, said, no, you should stay out of, out of loyalty. So uh, Lifton says, in describing the conversation with um, his daughter, she had long talks with her younger brother who shared her pain and confusion. They recognized the terrible events their father had been part of, but concluded that, quote, we cannot condemn him. We can't condemn him himself. She seemed to appreciate the opportunity to explore these feelings with me, but remained anguished by the basic contradiction about her father. At the end of our interview, she summed up her dilemma by asking me, as one who, quote, studies these matters, a terse question, can a good man do bad things? I did not have a simple answer for her, and there was not a time for a more complicated one. What I did say was, yes, 
but he's then no longer a good man. Mm. Mm. Um, thank you. Yeah, we, we would love to open it up now. And, and I'm seeing pointy. Yes, oh, hi. Hi, guys. Uh, uh, so this is the second time I've, I've seen the, the play. And I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to play. I'm going to play others. Um, extended over 400 years. This was 10. I, but I still can't, <laughs> these young women, they, they were typing, they were talking, they were making phone calls. They knew what was going on and so did these other people involved with it. And I, I have a problem with that. And I, I can't be any more uh, articulate about it than that. What would I have done? Well stated. I, I just would ask um, or invite you to let it soak in a little bit, and, and particularly, particularly considering how the Hal firm was actually formed before they even took the job. So really looking at uh, their community, these are also young women, so there, there's going to be a uh, how shall I say, much more of a, of a, of a close-knit understanding of identity is going to be based on the people who are around us. And when the propaganda from World War II, or particularly uh, around the uh, supremacy of the German race, and all of those others were threats to it, what that actually does to a young mind a young impressionable mind. So just, just maybe, I'd be very curious to have a conversation with you in a, in a year, you know, because these things take some time. And I think right now we, we just have to still kind of grieve, get over a little bit of the anger that, that came up, I'm sure, but, uh, but not really come to some conclusions about changing our way at, th at this point. At this point, I still think marinating is, is a good way to go. I, I hope that helps. I really do. And, and the playwrights are not asking you to forgive these people. Indeed not. And the playwrights aren't asking you necessarily to humanize them per se. But I think they are asking you to look in the mirror. Um, not in terms of whether you could commit those acts but to understand what is possible for all of us in our day-to-day -day behaviors. That, that, I think, is what they're asking of us. Okay. We'll start there, and then we'll go up and work our way across. Yes? Um, are there any examples uh, that you can think of? We all know about the Nuremberg trials, but during any of these trials or prosecutions, did any of the Germans acknowledge I, these yeah. actually and sorry, just checking. Was everybody able to hear that question? With the masks, sometimes I don't know. Okay, good. I, I can't answer that question completely, but I think what's important to do is to, to parse your question into two pieces. 
Did they acknowledge their acts is one question. The other is, did they acknowledge that their acts were wrong? And I think to a very large extent, they did not acknowledge they were wrong. Um, Albert Speer, whom you may know, it was Hitler's architect. He was, he was described as Hitler's architect. In fact, he was much more than that. After the war, he plays a very important role in our understanding of, of, of the, the thought processes. And it was he who first ta started talking about this concept of moral neutrality. Yes, we did all those things, but I was only an architect. Yes, there, was, there, was bad, there were bad things done, but I was only playing my role. And so I think that, 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 that it's an important distinction. Did they, did, were they willing to acknowledge that what they did was affirmatively bad? I don't know enough to, to be able to answer that question, but let's understand that after the war, all of them were trying to justify what they did in one, or explain to themselves, if not to the courts, if not to, to the press, but explain to themselves why they behaved the way they did. And I think it's important to think of it that way. I, I like the term Hina Aranza, motorless malignancy. Say the term again, I'm sorry. Motorless malignancy, Hina Arant. That's a quote from her book yeah. in describing some of the energy. Yeah. There was, uh, yes, right? And I think that's part of the question, uh, it really is, because um, the, the judgment aspect of this is going to have these different factors. So I do think that when you ask the, the, the children, was he a good father? And if you look at some of the pictures, if that was the accurate description of their lives on a regular basis, they would probably say yes, because their understanding of good or their, their, their the working definition of good is around, you know, he provided, he kept us safe, he, you know, all those sorts of things. But then we also have uh, narratives from those who were, who were injured, greatly injured, uh, people who were exterminated by his actions. And so their notion of good, of course, is gonna come from, from, their, from their subjective experiences. And so that's what makes it it's such a provocative question. But I want to uh, draw, draw just a, a bit, draw it a little bit about um, how the judgments change. Uh, again, you know, with, with, the, with the statue toppling and, and cancel culture, I don't like using that word normally, but I think we all know what we mean when, when we say it. And so, for lack of a better, under, a better word or a better term, with cancel culture being a real thing and being a great fear for those who are you know, in the professions as well as anybody that happens to be a social media, um, one has to wonder, you know, when, it, when is society going to change their opinion about me? And what will it take? Is it uh, an occasion when I, when I uh, show my, control over somebody who has been oppressed? Is it uh, when I have participated in some way in, in, a, in, a, in a force or, or an issue that now, now today has much more attention than it did um, a long time ago? I was gonna buy a ticket and go to SeaWorld today and I thought about my niece complaining to me about all those whales that they have trapped. And so I'm thinking 20 years from now, if that becomes like the greatest sin that we're holding on to, then I become an evil person. 
So I just, you know, there is, there is a wave effect of this. The judgments don't last forever, it seems. And so we have to consider that as part of the, part of the question. And so for me, um, for me, I think that good is, does not have an objective answer, as you said. Um, ethics doesn't have an objective answer. In, in fact, th there is a concept of Nazi ethics because what they thought they were doing was, in fact, ethical. There's a, there's a wonderful, wonderful may not be the right word, there's a fascinating speech given by Himmler in 1943 uh, to, to the leaders of the SS. And, and it's recorded, Hitler, uh, Himmler liked to hear himself speak. Himmler was in charge of the SS. And in it, he says, what we are doing is really difficult. It's uncomfortable, it's, it's awful, but we are the moral force. We are the ethical people. And so we have to do it. He goes on to say, however, if I catch any of you stealing one mark from these Jews whom we're killing, one fur, one piece of jewelry, one cigarette, off with your heads. We don't do those kinds of things. So uh, as I think about the, the, the good question, I think that what it challenge challenges each of us is to ask whether what we are doing is in our minds good. We can't control how other people think about that necessarily. But I think the question is, can we feel comfortable with what we did? Which doesn't ignore the fact that they did. But the best we can do is ask that about ourselves. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, I, was there someone over there who has since given up? No, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Let me answer factually, meaning less interestingly, and Father Bell can answer it more interestingly. Factually, during that period, there were choices. There are many, many examples of doctors who decided they didn't want to be part of this and were transferred. Examples of lawyers who didn't want to be participating. I'm talking about the professional class. I'm not talking about the, 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 the guards. Uh, in the play, you, you heard uh, Wirtz saying, I'd like to be transferred elsewhere. You heard about a, a doctor who asked, who asked to be sent to become a doctor at Sachsenhausen because he didn't want to be at the front. There were affirm affirmative choices that, that were being made there. And that's one of the things that we have to understand about those professionals then is that, that they did not have a gun to their head, but. Tribalism is a very, very powerful phenomenon because it feeds on some of our basic needs in a way that, um, that, that, causes, uh, oof, that, ca that causes us to create the space of safety, the space of the real, the space of, of, uh, of fostering and growth. So it will say, uh, the, the way that, that uh, tribalism forms, if you will, is to say that here is right, with us is the best, with us is safe, with us we can do. Which means, outside of that, it is not safe. You don't know who you are, you won't be accepted and you don't belong and you can't do anything. So that kind of a mobilization is very, very real for people. 
when we think about structures and dynamics of obedience within tribes, within the, uh, the tribalistic uh, group, right, the tribalized group, if you will, um, the, the, those, those, that structure of obedience is itself something that compels us, uh, that, that begins to become a, an impediment to a free choice of doing something else. When we're told that we actually do belong and this is who we are because we belong, that identity that we might ascribe to and take to ourselves and know about ourselves um, becomes so sure that to step out of it and not know who we are or what we're doing is, is, too, is too scary to deal with. And also the big thing is if we can move together as this group and to do something that we feel is right, that, that actually highlights and forwards our values, then the opposite about not being in the group and not being able to do anything becomes another fear. So I just want to say that the, you know, that the, that the, that the effect, the effect and the effect of tribalism uh, is very, very powerful. And so it co-ops and, and presents a myriad of impediments to what would otherwise be a free choice. One of the, the professions that we look at is the design, the designers, design profession. And one of the interesting things to think about is the SS uniform. Uh, the SS uniform was this really cool design. And the, the, the people who had the, 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 the right to wear it became part of the in-group. And so when we think of the ethics of design and then think of the tribalism that, that goes along with being part of the in-group, it's, it's, it's enticing. Yes, indeed. It is. Uh, okay, one, one last one, and then I'm, I'm afraid we have to call it a night. Go ahead. Right, so part of the, um, <clears throat> my thought about this is, I, strangely enough, even though I, I, I talk a lot about reconciliation, is I think atonement needs to be, uh, first of all, it needs to be watered down a little bit, and the whole notion of forgiveness uh, needs to be taken off the table for, for a moment. Because I think it's about how do we actually sit with what's going on now, and having the processes to deal with that. Um, I do believe that any kind of struggle to, to manage the reality of a family member who we have revered in some way, turning out to be, in, 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 a, in a very real case, monstrous in what they've done. Notice, I didn't identify them as a monster. Um, really holds within it, holds within it a desire for the atonement. And so if that is the truth, then we can take it off the table right now and deal with what you know with what's percolating. So um, that being the case, I think that there again there there has to be some some good language that that has to be developed to to really begin to talk about where folks are. Some great processes uh, are starting to come out right now. Really starting to come out about nonviolent uh, communications, uh, compassionate yet prophetic listening. These things that have been institutionalized and used as strategies and tactics from the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, so we can kind of come face to face with what's actually happening. Now, this is of a new, I mean, uh, the newer generation are the ones that are really taking that by, you know, by storm, because the older generations, we're, we're, we're kind of still stuck in that, well, uh, you know, we're still paralyzed by shame, and shame that is mutated into this monster of silence and hiding for the benefit, for the benefit of either family, personal identity and purpose, cultural norms, social acceptance, all those sorts of things. So it's all mutated and so we have to find a way 
to be able to, to, to walk that back and to be able to have the dialogue in ways that are, that are, that are enlightening without at all watering down the wrong because I think that the gravity of the, of the wrong has to be on the table, has to be talked about. Does that help? Okay. Thank you. So I, this has been an amazing talk. We could, we could do this all night, but we won't. Uh, but Father Bell, David, thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us for this.